This is Matthew McConaughey. Natalie Portman. James Patterson. Michael Ian Black. And you are listening to Five Questions with Dan Chabell. Carly, welcome to Five Questions. Dan, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. So I want to start in the early days because I think you have a really powerful, compelling story, especially as an entrepreneur, fellow entrepreneur. Uh, what was it about your co-founder, Danielle, that made you want to launch the skim with her when you met in Rome? And how was that reinforced when you worked at NBC? Uh, it's a great question. Um, so I should say normally Danielle and I, I do these conversations together, but she is on uh, family leave right now with her, her second child. Um, so uh, she's here in spirit, but um, we did not come up with the skim when we met at 20 on a study abroad program in Italy, we reconnected at NBC. Um, so what sort of first drew, I think each other to the other was just, you know, it was, we were friendly in college living in, in Europe and having a, a nice study abroad time. What made us actual close friends while working at NBC was um, being peers in the same um, part of our career entry level and then kind of the next phase up of trying to figure out what does our career path look like and how do we um, really create the career we want to have, knowing that we entered the workforce in the middle of a financial crisis of 2008. Um, and I think we were drawn to each other because of similar interests and growing up, I think, in similar families with similar values. Um, what ended up having us trust each other and for me to trust her as a business partner, the foundation of that was values um, and uh, knowing that success looked the same for both of us. Um, and I think we've had a lot of tests around trust and um truly like one of the best parts of the of this game is is our friendship as the foundation of it. Uh, I mean, I think trust is the foundation of every relationship, I think you would agree. Yeah. And and I think that the companies that have been the most successful based on the ones we've studied over the past few years are the ones that have built the most trust, but even before the pandemic. Totally. And, I mean, it is obstacles. like a marriage in, in a certain respect. Um, and, you know, you have to have all the hard conversations before you kind of take that leap. Um, and then you have to make sure that trust is still the foundation of that. And some of the great obstacles that you entered in early was you were originally pitching investors. And like most entrepreneurs, you got rejected like crazy. In fact, I mean, you probably still get rejected, to be honest. I've been doing this for such a long time, and there's still so much rejection. And that doesn't really go away, especially if you're pushing boundaries and you want to improve and grow. Uh, why was hearing no so many times actually a blessing in disguise for you? Um, so you're right. We got rejected a lot in the beginning. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things you realize very early on is that if you have thin skin, being an entrepreneur is not for you. And so we quickly um, developed that thick skin. And I think, you know, if there is a blessing to, to getting so many no's is that it forced us to make sure that one, like, is our idea really solid? And it was. And like, at that point, like we had immediate traction, you know, we had a brand and a loyal following well before we actually had the business. Um, and that, you know, well, well before we monetized, well before we actually took it investors. So even on the worst days of hearing no, so many times we were seeing thousands upon 10,000s upon thousands and thousands of women signing up for the skin. So you couldn't really argue with that. Um, but the no's forced us to realize, are we actually saying our pitch in a way that people can follow along? And it forced us to communicate in a really clear way, what is that big vision? Can we, are we saying it right? Should we reframe the narrative? Should we tell it this way? And I remember it was truly after like 150 no's. I mean, we have this whole spreadsheet that we've talked about a lot that is just full of red and the red is people that said no. Yeah. Um, and I remember we were literally sitting on a stoop in Manhattan in the, in the village um, eating a turkey sandwich. And we we're like, what are we saying that's not resonating? Because Users are signing up, they're getting it, but something we're doing isn't resonating. And we redesigned the pitch then and, and said it, you know, for the hundredth millionth time once again. And then the next week we got our first institutional money. So it's just, I think it forced us to keep hustling and keep making sure that we were telling our narrative in a way that um, others could follow. And it's learning and development, right? Like you became much better at it. I know that my mentality has always been, I'll, you know, say no all you want. I'm just going to come back with a stronger pitch or value proposition. Like in your case, it could be we have another million subscribers or whatnot, or or additional investors. You should invest. Like you start to as you can grow and develop, you start to hone and and make the pitch more powerful and compelling. 
which will give you at least increase the probability that you'll get a yes. Absolutely. I think that's great advice. And reflecting on 10 years of being in business, it's kind of amazing. I remember when you first launched, it really does feel like just yesterday, to be honest, especially because I was living in New York for 10 years (laughs) and I know you're based there. Uh, What are you most proud of? And if you could go back in time, what would you change? That's such a good question. Um, I think I, I am most proud of being here after 10 years. I don't mean me. I mean like the company. And I say that because look at what's happened in the last 10 years. Um, we, our political system has completely had upheaval. We have seen our audience of millennial women, um, get just decimated by a pandemic, by fighting a wage gap, now fighting for reproductive rights, um, by getting a seat at the table. We've witnessed so much history and a lot of ugly history in these last 10 years. Um, I think we have run a profitable business in a pandemic. Um, we you know, have been able to lead a team that's amazing, and I'm so proud of them through all of this. Um, and I think, you know, as I'm sure, you know, many other leaders that have been on, on this show have talked about, you know, it's been really hard to be a leader in these last two and a half years, and it's been a real test of leadership. So I'm really proud, not only that we're here and thriving, but Danielle and my partnership is, is in great shape. Um, and that ultimately it's allowing the skim and the company to best serve this audience and this generation of women that's never needed what we do more. We make it easier to live smarter and, and we make it easier for her to navigate all these complex areas in her life that like she needs, we all need right now. Um, so I'm so proud of that. I think what I wish, um, you know, what do I, what do I wish I knew so many things? Um, if I could like go back in time, I think that there, um, I think I probably, probably should have hired like an exec team earlier. I think that we were, you know, we've always been like, we've never grown the fastest. We've always like been like slow and steady and kind of like the little engine that could. And like, we're like, just keep our eye on the ball. And I think because of that, you know, some decisions that we made um, maybe came a little bit later than maybe they should have if we knew what we know now then. So I probably would have hired like our exec team probably like a year before we actually did. And speaking about making an impact and your audience, you know, there's millions of women who lost their jobs over the past one to two years. And so, that you know, there's a certain level of responsibility, like with great power, with great platform comes great responsibility. Uh, how have you inspired thousands of people to vote in or hundreds of thousands of people to vote in elections? And recently, you're, you've had a big push to, uh, to get companies to offer paid family leave to working women. Uh, yeah. What responsibility do you think you have in this regard to impact change? I love this question. I think we have a big one. I think we used to say when we started the skim, you know, what we were doing was a privilege. And I think over time it became a responsibility that has just become a a grave responsibility. And it's hard to kind of uh, overstate that. Um, In the last three elections alone, we've gotten a million women to get out there and vote. Um, 80% of our audience says we're their primary source of um, information to go vote in the midterms. That's a huge responsibility. Um, there is so much at stake. Uh, you mentioned our work with paid family leave. Um, over 550 companies have now joined our paid family leave database to be transparent about their policies and in many cases make change. Um, and I think what we're seeing, all of this is really a response to going back to our, our mission. The systems in place are not set up right now to help women. Our audience is this generation that is a once in a lifetime generation. And I say that not just because I happen to be a, a part of that generation, but because never before has there been a generation that has so much going for her. Like she's out earning her male counterparts. Mm-hmm. She is getting a seat at the table. She's more educated too. More, more educated. Ha- yep. Yeah. She is influencing like trillions in spending and making the household decisions. Like there's a reason every advertiser wants to reach her, but like she's drowning. She cannot take paid family leave on a national scale. She got kicked out of the workforce in the pandemic and was pulling a double shift. Um, She has been still fighting the wage gap. It is that much harder for women of color. And so all of these things, there's so much at stake right now. Like we have the ability to not just inform her, but to activate her, to show up and cast that vote and to show up and and help show her company the type of policies that they need to have. it's it's the greatest privilege of my life to be able to be a part of that and the greatest privilege of Danielle's life and our team. Um, but the potential for impact, um, it's hard to to kind of overstate how huge it is and how important it is right now to to be a part of this. Yeah, and I, I learned this like 
years ago with the skin, when you recommend a book, like yeah. thousands and thousands of books <laughs> would be sold. Right. And, yeah. but I, I also do agree with all these women who've undergone, they, they've had to do so many different roles in the household, you know, worker, you know, mom, you know, uh, wife, like, you know, doing the chores, like there's just, you can only do so much, right? We're all human 24 hours in a day. And I think that the focus on, you know, you know, maternal leave, but also like, you know, childcare support, like those are the the two main focuses for helping women because those are the things that are kind of preventing them. And then there's also, of course, like, you know, a lot of the research on lead in shows that once they hit middle management, they're more likely to drop out because of those reasons. Too. Yeah. So and I a- think there's all of that. And then also, you know, if you want to look at it, they're like a pure economic and, and business lens, like as a business owner, like I'm, we're always looking like what is, you know, the best way for us to invest as a company and the best way for us to invest in a company is in growing employees and making sure that like, we're setting them up to succeed. Um, so if you're creating a, an infrastructure where you're constantly having to replace people because they are being ousted from the workforce, or we're not making policies that allow it them to, um, grow a family, then that's a really big cost to you as an employer. Um, So there's a lot of reasons why we're huge advocates for paid family leave. But if you want to look at it and just from a pure economic lens, it's actually really bad business to not support this. Well said. And what's your best piece of career advice? Oh, um, best piece of career advice I actually got recently, which is that uh, life in your career is um, not a still picture. It is a motion picture. And that was really good advice because, you know, you remember like you know, somebody you might've met with two years ago, you're like, oh, they didn't like the skin. They didn't invest. And it's like, who knows where they were two years ago? Doesn't mean like, like, don't get stuck on like that still picture. Um, life is like, is a movie and like, make sure that like you, you revisit contacts, don't build up walls, um, against things. And, um, people evolve, things evolve, macro environments evolve. And, um, basically it's like, don't get hung up on stuff. And you don't know what you don't know. Like exactly. when you're 22 versus 27, totally. like you've had yeah. more experience and then you can probably make better decisions or you met a certain person who leads you in a different way, like, you know, through your company and through, you know, I know you do a lot of speaking and you wrote a book and like there's so much and that could lead you yeah. in all these different directions. Absolutely. As so well basically as don't close the, the door. <laughs> Absolutely. That's great advice. And thank you so much for being on the show. And thank you so much. This was awesome.